Any questions, take one or two. All right, this is video number, I don't even know, 17 maybe in this run and gun tanning series. I have taken all of the interesting, relevant questions from all 16 of the other videos, I think it was, and we're just going to go through them. This might take a couple of videos, I don't know. Andreas Upside Down uh, would like to ask, which method of tanning to use on wool on sheepskins for clothing garments? A lot of people want to know that. A lot of people want to know about tanning furs. Uh, when most people get interested in tanning hides, they're usually interested in tanning furs first. That's not really my wheelhouse. I mean, I've done quite a bit of it when I was younger, but I'm certainly, uh, you know, it's not a great interest of mine, and I'm, I don't do it very much at all anymore, almost not at all. So I only have so much advice to offer. Um, the, one of the safest ways is to use alum and salt. I don't use alum and salt because I can't gather alum. It does occur naturally, but it's very uncommon, so it's not like something you can just run out and find somewhere. But it does set the, uh, the wool or fur in really well, and so it's a pretty safe method to use. The main thing with tanning uh, furs is just to not let the hair slip out, and so you have to be on top of things. You can't be a flake like me. Don't do what I did and take a, a flesh, pretty fleshy hide and stuff it into a bark solution and just leave it there without doing anything until it uh, rots. Uh, you know, you're going to have to stay on top of it, flush it well, get the tanning process through quickly, make sure that that tannin's getting into the hide so that it shrinks the hide and sets the hair, um, you know, in a timely manner so that the hair doesn't start to fall out or anything like that. Anyway, I think bark tan's a great way to go. And you could also probably do, I haven't done it, but you, I'm sure you could do some kind of a combination tan where you, you know, treat it with alum first to set the hair and then finish it off with vegetable tanning. Okay, Peter Lustig, very interesting indeed, but the tanning process is supposed to happen under constant movement, not flipping the skin once a week. Okay, we have a big old barrel with a small motor rotating the whole solution while switched on. Back in the day, it would have been kids. Um, yeah, I mean, supposed to, eh, it, it's, tanning will happen faster if you keep things in constant motion. But one of the most uh, revered traditional tanning methods is pit tanning, where you lay in bark, you lay in hides, you lay in bark, you lay in hides, you make a big lasagna like that, and you just leave it for up to three, four months at a time. Uh, a lot of times, the first time it's left for a shorter period of time, like um, maybe two months, I'm not really sure, and then they'll pull everything out, put in fresh bark, and relayer it, and then leave it for a little bit longer, three months. Sometimes that was done for over a year, for more than a year. Uh, so, you know, there's more than one way to skin a cat. I've tanned a lot of great leather without moving anything uh, much, you know, just you got to move it enough. You're going to get more even color if you move it in the beginning. Uh, later on, it doesn't seem to make as much difference. Yeah, I mean, you'll get it done a lot faster if you keep it moving constantly. But, you know, traditional tanners um, were sometimes opposed to that because they thought it produced a lower quality leather. And the leather chemists were like, no, you can get it done faster. You're going to make more money. You're going to use less tanning material, et cetera, et cetera. Then again, other traditional methods used uh, things that would tan the hides in literally a matter of hours uh, for thin skins in certain situations. And obviously there's an advantage there, but they also had to invest more labor uh, to get it done that fast. Bottom line though, the more you move the hides, the faster they're going to tan. Okay, out of names to choose says, do you have any plans to make suede from some of the skins that would have a ton of uses? When we say suede, people are referring usually to a leather that's fuzzy on both sides. But the suede that most people know is what is known as a split. So a split is where you take the leather and you split the thickness so that you get one piece that's the top with the grain on it, the smooth, shiny grain. And then the, the sub layer can be, uh, you know, big sheets of what some people would call suede or, you know, another name for them is splits. If I can get access to a splitter or make one, I will probably split that cattle hide into uh, top grain and, and a split just because, yeah, it is useful. For instance, like these boots, the Jim Green boots I'm wearing have a liner, so the inside layer uh, in the bottom shoe part where your foot is, 
is a split. Uh, it's really good for strops. So yeah, it has a lot of uses. It's it's cool. Um, it's definitely not as fun and uh, you know desirable as full grain leather, but it's definitely useful, and that's why I would prefer to get a splitting machine and split that hide instead of trying to shave it down and just wasting, like shaving off the, the flush side and uh, wasting it basically. Okay, Van Sant Haas, is there any way you can test tannin levels without buying a testing kit? I read that commercial tanners use chestnut, if I remember correctly, 30% tannin concentrate. I want to start testing different batches, but the only kit I found was $175. $175. Yes, there's something called a barkometer. It is just a glass tube that's sealed with um, a weight in the bottom so that it kind of pokes upright and bounces up and down like this and it has a scale inside it that you read according to you know how far it sinks so if you put it in distilled water it's going to sink to a level that's like zero you know and this same device is used to measure salt sugar all kinds of different things but there's one there is one for bark and all it is is they just change the scale a little bit or you know to tell you like what's the percentage of salt in the solution like i have a salometer i have a um you know one for measuring bricks like you know sugar content for making wine and stuff like that i don't think they're made anymore braintan.com uh, matt richard's site used to sell them but i'm not sure you can get them anymore however if you can figure out what the measurements are relative to a salometer or a bricks, you know, sugar measurement specific gravity thing, then you can extrapolate. It measures specific gravity. So what it does is that let's say you have uh, distilled water, you put a bunch of tannin in it. Well, that tannin has body to it, right? And, and it's gonna change the density of the liquid. And as the liquid density changes, that thing's gonna float upward and it's gonna be lifted, right? Because it's a, it's a weighted thing. So it's gonna lift up and the more tannin you put in, the higher it's gonna lift and that's how you get your readings. So you could, you know, compare them and, and someone should do this. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a barcometer, but someone should do this and, you know, write down what the, like a table, conversion table for using other specific gravity measuring. I can't remember the name of this thing. It has a name, um, but just, you know, so we can extrapolate and use something else besides a barcometer. Um, but I would go with that route and, um, you know, I don't measure tannin, um, but it's, you know, it'd probably be handy for me to be able to uh, test like all kinds of different tanning materials just to get an idea of say if like I boil two ounces of this versus two ounces of that what's the specific gravity difference going to be. Glenn Wick, any reason to use lime over wood ash? So wood ash is fine, it works, um, it has a lot of calcium and it also has a lot so it has lime in it uh, but it also has potassium hydroxide and it has at least some sodium hydroxide from what I've read. Uh, that may explain why wood ashes are so variable so the problem with wood ashes is it, maybe if you were using the same wood ashes from the same area and the same species all the time it would be more consistent but it just tends to be very inconsistent so i've used like uh, the egg test where you float an egg in the in the uh, ashes and it's supposed to show like a certain amount of the egg above like the size of a quarter or a half dollar or a nickel or whatever and that's supposed to tell you what the specific, again, we're back to specific gravity, like how much uh, stuff is dissolved in the water. But it may be that because it has more than one component that um, it, you could measure the specific gravity of an ash liquor, but get you know, a stronger liquor than you're expecting or a weaker liquor. So the problem is really consistency. Move it occasionally and check it frequently. And if it's not swelling up, like the skin needs to swell, and the hair's not starting to come out with, you know, at least a little bit within about a week, uh, chances are it's too weak. If you go back in a few days, and I've had this happen as, as quick as overnight, I've had uh, skins completely destroyed in a wood ash solution that was measured with an egg, and usually it shouldn't dam really damage the skin at all, but just that overnight just falling apart. So, you know it's inconsistent that's the issue with wood ashes that's really why i use lime and i like lime because i can make it um, i think it's cool that i make my own lime obviously i make my own wood ashes too but the consistency is really nice uh, because with lime i know what i'm getting 
Um, the lime that I use is fat which means uh, fat lime is like high calcium lime. It doesn't have a lot of, or any magnesium in it. And a lot of limes, like a lot of limestones, are full of magnesium, like a, a large quantity of magnesium. And I don't really know how that affects uh, tanning because I've never used those limes. But the lime I have is consistent. I can put a whole bunch, like put in too much in the water, stir it up. And the other thing about lime is that lime won't get too strong. So only so much of that lime is going to go into solution and then it's just going to stop and any extra is just going to sit on the bottom. So then if I go and I stir the hide, let's say the hide's kind of like using some of the lime up, it's binding to the hide and stuff. I stir it up, there's more lime on the bottom, that comes out and re-strengthens the solution. Um, if it's good lime and it's working correctly and used enough, it shouldn't like destroy, the, it should take a long time to damage the hides. It will eventually. And it does take out some of the skin substance, but uh, yeah, it's pretty safe. So lime's a safer bet to use as long as you use the right lime. Watch my video linked here on uh, types of lime to use in tanning and not use in tanning. The Fox Mine says they've been tanning sheep hides for a year now with alum and salt, interested in making some leather and have been trying with three lamb hides. For now it is a disaster. Tried lime soaking with various lime quantity and the hair is not coming off, but the skin breaks apart. I don't know why. Last time was only 100 grams of garden lime to 130, that's the problem there, 30 liters of warm water. Soaked for two days. The skin is so damaged that I can't do anything but throw my hard work out. Okay, not totally sure what's up with that. That's really fast. Um, if the hide was soaking in warm water for two days, like really warm water, and it was kept warm, that's probably the problem. Garden lime, at least here in the States, is just ground limestone. It doesn't have the chemistry that we need. So you need lime that's been burned and then slaked, and that's called hydrated lime. So again, watch the video that I, I'm going to link, and I'll link it in the description too, on types of lime to use and not use in tanning. If you get the, the lime solution right, I can't think of a skin that should fall apart in two days or a week or two weeks. It should be able to sit in there fine. Uh, just make sure it's, you know, move it once in a while, make sure it's saturated. Okay, William Frankian, uh, do red oak leaves work in tanning? Plenty of those around, but no tan oak. Well, red oak bark will certainly work. I'm sure red oak leaves would work, but they may not have all that much tannin in them. So, you know, a lot of people want to use whatever's kind of just laying around, like the tree, the leaves that the tree drops and stuff like that. If you're going to use that stuff, it's probably going to involve multiple boilings with the same liquor, you know, the same water with different batches of leaves. So say like make a big old batch of leaves, add a bunch of water to it, cook that for a while, dump that onto a new batch of leaves, cook that for a while, probably dump that onto a new batch of leaves, and I don't know how many times you're going to have to do that to get a strong enough solution. But if you have red oaks around, there's red oak bark, and at some point a tree is going to fall down, even in towns, like if it's around a lot, you know, in the neighborhood there's going to be tree work, uh, trees are going to fall down, stuff like that, so Keep your eyes out for those barks instead of trying to use uh, kind of substandard materials. That said, it might work. I would test it on a very small piece of skin first, but you're probably going to have to process a whole lot of material. Okay, dye prout. There is lacking an idiot's guide to sheepskins, and they're a massive wasted resource. Uh, alum looked the easy option. Any thoughts? Alum's the easy option. It, in terms of just getting the hair set and getting through the first part, at least, yeah, I don't have much more to say about it. I know that Matt Richards, um, he's uh, traditional tanners, I think, on Instagram. And uh, he, he does hair on sheepskins in veg tan. Uh, but he has like a full on tannery with machines and, and stuff going up there in Oregon. So you might want to follow him on Instagram, look through his content. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, if you put in the time to figure it out, it, it works. Oscar Kettler says, a bit late to the party, but all alkaline solution attacks keratin. Bases dissolve hair. That's why sodium hydroxide is used in shower drains, not sulfuric acid. It breaks down hair quite readily. Exactly. It is much slower to act on collagen, which is the basic, you know, skin, what your skin is made of, but it attacks keratin readily, which is what the very thin outside of your skin is made of. Just a very thin layer called the uh, epidermis and the hair but that also includes the processes that are in the hair roots 
So the alkali is going to get down into the hair roots, destroy the hair root, eat it up, and then the hair slips out. That's how it works. Okay, reconciliation says, why not use the hair for plaster? Uh, sheep hair would probably be very difficult to use for plaster. It's very tangly, you know, it's curly, it would be hard to cut up enough. I think you would, if you tried to mix it in plaster, you would probably end up with a tangly mess and like a lot of clumps and stuff. The hairs that were used in um, plasters were more like straight hairs. The one I know is used the most that I always hear about is uh, horse hair. Cecil Rhodes, I have a question about the strategy from going from carcass to preservation. Like if you were to kill a deer and take it back to your place, gut it, skin it, how much of the animal would you preserve using as little technology as possible, meaning refrigerator and other appliances. Like if you were going to tan the hide, would you just chuck the skin straight into a tanning solution? What about the meat? Uh, would you just can everything? to do other stuff, collagen, which you use for glue, ligaments, cord. Um, so yeah, almost everything can be preserved in terms of like the tanning. Yeah, you could start the tanning right away, but it's also really easy to, to dry skins as long as they don't have too much fat on them and tan them later. The thing that's the most difficult is like liver, you know, organs, liver, kidneys, uh, things like that that spoil really fast. And so that's often why those are eaten as soon as the animal is killed right? They're grilled on the fire. I mean, that's what I usually do and uh, eat those right away. But all of the meat can be dried. You know, you can preserve pretty much everything for use. If you're making glue, you want to dry the glue stock first. So the tendons or whatever you're going to use are pieces of skin. You want to dry those first. So you can always put that off and make the glue later. Not really a tanning question, but interesting. Timothy Longmore, I bark tanned some cowhide belts and they dried out and are stiff as hell. I used neat soda on them as soon as they were dry enough to absorb it. They sat a couple of months and are too stiff to use for anything. Any tips on softening them? Try soaking, bending back and forth, pounding with a hammer. Should softening be done while still stretched on a frame like a moose hide? Uh, those are probably not actually tanned. Uh, chances are that they're dyed. Uh, maybe the liquor didn't penetrate all the way and there's a core that's basically rawhide. So right, if I take a piece of hide and I begin to tan it and the tanning gets like a little bit of the way in, but not all the way, it's not gonna tan the hide. And what you're gonna end up with is a strip of rawhide with a thin casing of leather on the outside. In some cases and in some solutions, you can soak it long enough that you'll get color all the way to the middle, but it doesn't mean that it's actually tanned. So, this is the typical problem, uh, likely, of people just not using enough tannin because uh, it just takes a lot more than, than you think. But uh, yeah, cut, cut a piece open and it appears that way that like it's, it's like um, a casing of leather on both sides with rawhide in between, you need to go back to tanning. If you've already put a bunch of oil on them, I don't know, I'd probably just start over uh, with the new hide. Dennis Lanigan, uh, do you ever just leave some impossible hairs and just hope the bait does freeze them and have you had success with that? So what he's talking about is like sometimes you get stubborn hairs. I noticed them a lot in goat hides. It varies like if the animal is just growing a lot of new hair. So it has these like deep small hairs that aren't mature yet. Uh, sometimes those will not want to come out when you dehair the hide. And I've noticed that at times like the the lime swells the hide so much that it almost locks some of the stuff in there and that when you soak it uh, it'll kind of loosen up and the stuff starts to come out as far as seeing it come out more with the bait i'm not sure actually i was thinking more along the lines of you know coming out with relaxing the hide or getting the hide to in a fall what's called a fallen state or getting it to fall which means going from this like rubbery state that it gets in the lime to just completely relaxing and being super floppy. And that's gonna relax those, um, those pores, the hair, the hair follicle uh, holes, whatever they're called, and uh, allow some stuff to come out. And baiting definitely does that too. It relaxes the hide even more, chews up some of the hide substance in there. And I would think that's true actually, but you know, if, if stuff is super stubborn and I've, I feel like I've limed it long enough, yeah, I'll just leave it and hope to get it out later. It's getting kind of dark out here. I'll try to get through these two pages, but there's uh, five pages. Any chance you could do any hair on tanning videos? No, probably not. Rotator cuff injury. <laughs> uh, could this flushing be done with a woodworking draw knife or does the uh, bevel angle have to be different? 
draw knives are actually used quite a bit, but they're used by people mostly and, and be they're best uh, with upright beams. So that's a beam that's actually almost vertical. You'll like lean it against a tree or something, the hide's just draped over it and you work this way instead of this way. Otherwise, I would stay away from draw knives. In, in terms of the bevel, well, first of all, they're too sharp. So if you're gonna take your woodworking draw knife and try to do hides with it, you're gonna to have to dull it and then you're gonna to have to sharpen it again for woodworking. So I would get like a dedicated one, probably make it a little more blunt, like just put a secondary bevel on the edge that's, you know, a lot steeper. Certainly more obtuse than for woodworking. Okay, Brand J, do the hide needs to be entirely clean before soaking in tannin, otherwise it's more work and what you scrape off is wasted tannin. I already answered this in one of the videos, uh, no. It's a matter of context. So, you know, more work, it's easier to flush hides once the, the fleshy stuff that's left on there is partly tanned. So I'm weighing like chopping bark and wasting a very small amount of tannin to tan that little skim of stuff but I'm making it easier to take off. So you can't just say that it's more work. Um, there's also, you know, personal preference. Is bark hard to get or is it not hard to get? I have sheds full of this stuff. Context, context is king. Pretty lagom. Hello, love your work, but I have some questions. I was thinking of tanning some of our cattle hides. How long would you recommend to sit in the solution if it is made up of spruce bark? Also, how would you need to trim down the neck and butt for the solution to get all the way through? Hmm. I'm a newbie at this, but thought I might give it a try instead of throwing them away. First of all, start small. Uh, with cattle hides, especially if you are raising cattle and you're going to have more in the future, you know, the hides aren't, don't consider them something so valuable that you have to tan the whole thing every time. I would trim them down. I usually will trim off like the whole belly section and not tan or to use it for making glue or something. Uh, often the neck is pretty cut up, trim off some of that, trim off the lower part of the butt where it's real thin and floppy, uh, like around the tail. And then uh, even then I would take maybe like a piece of the neck, like a square foot or, or two or something like that is a good thing to experiment on. The neck and butt don't have to be trimmed and thinned ahead of time to tan, it just will take longer to penetrate those parts of the hide which will increase the uh, total tanning time. More especially than the neck, uh, the, the butt area. So there's some of the butt areas just super hard, super tight leather. And since the fiber structure is so tight, it just takes a long time for that tannin to get through and, and work, like work its way and filter down into the center of the hide. So it's just gonna take a while, but no, you don't have to thin it down extra or anything like that. Spruce bark, uh, definitely used. I have no idea of what the tannin content or anything like that is. Amount of time totally varies. It depends on how much you're moving the hide, um, how well prepared it is, how thick it is, how dense it is, uh, too many variables. So you're just gonna go by tanning it and then taking like, look around the edge of the hide, pick out like the thickest, especially if it's the thickest and densest area, slice off about a quarter inch or maybe a little more and look at it and see if that uh, bark color has penetrated all the way through. If it hasn't or if you're not sure, throw it back in and tan it some more. And a look at this video on tanning materials because it does have the tannin content of spruce bark listed. Okay, James Catter. Interesting note on lime drying becoming limestone. I once had a deer skin soaking in lime to buck, uh, wet scraped the hair in gray and then ended up uh, drying it out because he got the flu. Um, tried to rinse it, but a short story, ended up having to rehydrate and neutralize with water and vinegar to try to dissolve, dissolve the lime. And after many rings and soakings in the vinegar solution, it stretched, uh, neutralized and stretched enough to brain tan it. Even then it took many applications and it was, you know, difficult. Felt like it had turned to limestone and was rough like you described. Yes. So what we're using for liming hides is uh, calcium hydroxide. When calcium hydroxide dries and is exposed to carbon dioxide, it absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and becomes limestone, which is where it started. Uh, limestone, shells, marble, chalk, all calcium carbonate. You're, you're like taking liquid rock putting it into your hide, dry it, and then you have a coating of liquid rock inside your hide. So not good. Don't dry hides out that aren't thoroughly delimed. Glenwood, damn, would love to have wool for insulation. Seems like it'd be great stuff, especially free. Is throwing hides in a running creek good for getting the alkalinity out or should you still scud and rinse it? Okay, first thing with the wool. Yeah, it's free, but it's really not because you have to process it. 
uh, believe me, I've collected piles of wool intending to use them for insulation and then been like, okay, now I have to sit here either with hand cards for like 20 hours, you know, fluffing this stuff up so it works better for one thing and it's not just clumped and you can like spread it out and, you know, get get good insulation versus just kind of like stuffing some raw wool in there. Um, or you got to come up with some kind of you know, machine carter or something that's, you know, more efficient. So, yeah, I mean, you probably could just kind of fluff it a little, stuff it in trash bags and put it in the wall, maybe, but I'm sure it's not going to work as well. So it's kind of free, but it's kind of not. However, it'd be great if there was like a mill around here where there's a lot of wool that, you know, that would buy wool from people uh, at a reduced price when wool prices are really low so that people don't, like my friend, doesn't just shear 200 sheep and throw the wool in a ditch. Second question, putting stuff in a running stream. Yeah, it definitely works to uh, dealkalize the hide and remove the lime to an extent. But like I said in this uh, series many times, if you go over it with the tool and scud it and press liquid out of it with the tool, you get a lot of junk in there that you don't really want in the hide. It's gonna help make that process quicker. But yeah, if you have a really clean running creek, um, it does work. It's used in traditional tanneries a lot. Um, but I imagine that it's not the only thing they did, and they probably did at least a little bit of scudding to get some of that other crap out. Devin Cooper, can you please talk about pickling hides? I tried a few times now with my kangaroo hides, but every time I try to neutralize the skin, it gets acid swell, I think, and it triples its thickness and becomes like gelatin and makes ultra stiff leather. I've tried adding salt to the neutralizing bath, but it still happened again. Yeah, that's just way too much uh, acid. So. Alkali will swell hides and acid will swell hides. So you can take a hide, put it in lime, it gets all plump and rubbery. You rinse most of that out. Uh, you can get it completely floppy. The thickness is down, it's back where it was pretty much. Put it in a strong vinegar solution or something and zoop, it'll just swell right back up. So just use uh, less, a lot less. Okay, Josh Redman, how do you tell when the hide is done in the bark tanning solution? I need to drink a beer for that one. Some people will use tests like bending the leather and squeezing it with your thumb and finger. I always use the uh, cutting method, so I'll just find a thick piece of the hide, cut off at least a quarter inch of the hide. You want to go into the hide a little bit, maybe like three-eighths of an inch, and just look at it, and you should see a pretty even color through. It won't be totally even. It might be a little darker at different parts of the hide, like on the outside, but you'll get a, a feel for it that it... You know, it looks tanned all the way through. And if you're in doubt, uh, it's better just to put it back for a little bit longer, maybe bump up the solution and uh, see what happens and then test it again and see if it looks any different. Dakota Hutch, I'm really loving this series. One thing I've definitely learned is that I don't scud nearly enough. Yes, and this is very, very common. It's a lot of work, you know, it's a lot of work to go over the hide like four to six times to just squish that stuff out, but it really does work. Again, if you have a clean running creek or a washing machine, you could probably get away with less. But what I like to do is, is just scud the hide and see what's coming out. Like when there's not a lot of gunk coming out, there's not like a bunch of root hairs and like yellow liquid, whatever junky stuff that looks like something besides clear water. I mean, it's not, it doesn't have to be completely clear but if it's consistently really milky or yellow or something like that or dirty, then I want to I want to get that stuff out of the hide. That's just how I roll. I mean, you can make good leather without going that far, but uh, most people still don't scud enough. Okay, one more and we're at halfway. We'll do uh, this again. Wondercade, could you sort of cheat on the stirring by putting a small water pump uh, fish tank size in the tub to keep the hides and uh, tanning liquid moving? Well, that would help with, for sure, and pumps are used that way in tanning, but the problem with uh, being in a tub is usually that the hide's going to be folded on itself, so it's going to be like, you know, laying on itself at places, it's going to be laying against the tub at places, and that circulation is really not going to do much for that. So if you could have the hides all suspended in there in a liquid and have a pump, that would be awesome. Another option they'll do is just having the hides rocking, like on a, some kind of rocker system of you know, things that raise up and down and it does the same thing. It's like keeping the hides moving or just, you know, stir them around a lot. And uh, yeah, movement helps. But the only problem with that plan is, is just that the major problem that most people have uh, with penetration has a lot to do with the hides being folded. And then so they have to be moved once in a while, although it could still help. 
Okay, let's knock off there and do this again. It's way too dark. It looks like my picture is super dark. 